it's uh, good to see, albeit a fairly small room, but a very full room of people, no doubt, who, uh, despite the attractions of central London on a, uh, where are we, Tuesday night, uh, have chosen to come and join us to talk about what is at the moment a very a shadowed topic, the future of the EU. The present that we live in is a very shadowed present. It's overshadowed by <coughs> what seems to be unremittingly gloomy news about economic crisis uh, in the Eurozone. But my basic message to you all is that we need to take the long view. We mustn't let the troubles of the here and now determine our future role. Now, uh, many of you here are uh, much younger than me. Some of you, who I know very well, are significantly older than me. But I think it's right to remind ourselves of why it is that we as a country 40 years ago decided to join uh, what was then the European <coughs> Economic Community. It was because we had lived through terrible shadows in the 20th century. We lived through uh, two world wars that ripped the continent apart, that meant that we spent billions of pounds in blood and treasure. And that whether we liked it or not, we were always drawn into the affairs of our neighbors in Europe. That's been the history of this country. We've either been willfully blind to the balance of power in Europe, uh, uh, or we have been dragged into it, kicking and screaming, and had to take part and use force of arms. Now, it seemed to our uh, fathers and forefathers that that was um, a, a wrong approach, that the cycle was depressingly familiar, that something had to change, that the experience that they all had in the Second World War meant that we had to do better. We were a bit late to the game. Sadly, uh, the post-war government decided that the European <coughs> community was some sort of capitalist club and didn't want us to join. Despite the best efforts of uh, Harold Millen, uh, we weren't able to join because of um, good old President de Gaulle and his particular view of France's role in Europe. <coughs> but we moved on, and under the uh, uh, stewardship of Edward Heath, we joined. Uh, and the Conservative Party, of which I've been a member now for more years than I care to remember, uh, was uh, uh, the party of Europe. It, it, it is the only one of the two main parties, and Martin will forgive me here because the Liberals have been consistently in favour of Europe, of the two main parties, the Conservative Party has been consistently in favour of our membership of the European Community and the European Union. That's still the case now. Whatever you may think about some of the debates that have gone on within the Tory party over the last, well, I have to say now, the best part of 20 years. And I'm not here really to talk about uh, debates between the parties, because the truth is that Europe is a debate that is often divided within the parties. That's undeniably the case. We had a referendum back in 1975, because there were divisions within the then governing Labour Party that the Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, thought were best addressed with by a referendum, and it, it worked. We had a very clear decision, a two to one vote in favor of our membership of the European community. And then uh, the question as to why we needed to be a member <coughs> of the European community was answered time and time again in the affirmative. We had the Single European Act in 1986, which Margaret Thatcher readily signed up to, which her government enacted into law, which committed to Britain to, let's not forget the words, ever closer union. And then we had what I regard uh, still as one of the most important developments in our uh, integration into the European Union, which was the Treaty of Maastricht. Uh, much derided still by some members of my party, in my view, one of the most successful negotiations that we conducted as a government. Getting the balance right, striking the right chord, committing ourselves to proper integration wh where it was in our national interest, but making sure that we uh, uh, had those necessary opt-outs uh, uh, where, where it was appropriate. Uh, and then we had the big debate about the euro. <coughs> uh, I took a view some 10 years ago that uh, we should have gone in. We should have gone in with uh, countries of the north of Europe and created, I think, what would have been a very different beast from the one that we see now. But you know, politics is about the world 
that we live in rather than the world that we like it to be. And the fact is that the history of our country in the European Union has taken us down a certain course. We're not a member of the Eurozone, and nor are we likely to be. We're not a member of a lot of the agreements such as Schengen that bring together other countries in Europe. But at the same time, we still stand strategically and politically in a very important place. There are huge common interests that we still have with the major countries of Europe, such as Germany, that mean to me that the question that is posed, does Britain have a future in the EU, is, to use the well-worn phrase, an absolute no-brainer. It's got to be a yes. Now, the problem for us, I think, and this is a problem that bedeviled the last government as much as it bedevils this government, is that we live in a country where increasingly powerful interests are lining up against Britain's membership of the European <coughs> Union. I was in Berlin a couple of weeks ago speaking to my colleagues in the CDU, and the media picture in Germany is so much more benign for those people who favour membership of the European Union. The German media are still, by and large, favourably disposed to Germany's role in Europe. I wish I could say the same about our media here in London. We are facing a concerted campaign from certain parts of the media that, it seems to me, designed to have one outcome, which is to drive us out of the European Union. Now, it's a significant campaign. It's being waged quite openly in some sections of the press, perhaps a bit more surreptitiously in other sections. But it is one that is systematically undermining the positive arguments that are still out there for membership of the European Union. And it's also a debate that has become very clouded, and I speak as a lawyer, in legalese. When you go into the House of Commons, and my colleagues will back me up on this 100%, the debates that we often have about the European Union are all about the interpretation of various articles, mm. the uh, legal opinions that are expressed <coughs> to and fro, and very seldom about the realities of what membership of the European Union means to the people who I represent, for example, in Swindon. <coughs> now, Swindon is typical of our country. It is a town with manufacturing, with IT, with life sciences, with a whole range <coughs> of industries that trade with the Eurozone and beyond. Let's take Honda, Honda UK, Japanese company but a British centre. 50% plus of its cars go to the Eurozone. If we withdrew from the EU tomorrow, suddenly the, the cost of those cars would go up by 10%. <coughs> suddenly a tariff barrier would appear that is not there at the moment. Now, for my workers in Honda, to talk about withdrawal from the EU is just madness. It's their job going down the Swanee. It's their livelihood, their family, that finding that the breadwinner is no longer in work. Now, that's a, a very simple example of a greater truth. But if we're going to win the debate about our continuing membership of the EU, we need to stop talking legalese and start talking about the real world, real jobs, and real people. And the argument is there to be won. I am absolutely convinced that if we end up in a situation where we have a referendum, and being frank, it seems to me that we are bit by bit edging our way towards that scenario. And of course, there's another question about what the issue would be, what the referendum would be about. It is incumbent on those of us who still believe our future lies in the EU to make those real-life arguments and to get the support of business and industry as well to make the case for our membership. It's as plain and simple as that. Because I believe that the current problems of the Eurozone, whether you're focusing on Greece, Spain, Portugal, Italy, will pass. Like everything, they will, we will move on. We will move on, probably not into a, an era of huge soaring <coughs> growth in Europe, but I believe that we will move into an era of greater stability. <coughs> Why do I say that? Because I am convinced that Germany wants this to work. Germany believes that its whole national interest is so vested in the future of Europe and the Eurozone that it will have to do 
more or less whatever it takes to make it work. The one worry that I have about the future of Germany and its involvement in Europe is whether or not at any stage inflationary pressures start to appear at home. And then we do have a serious question to ask. Now, I know I sound perhaps Panglossian or Micawberish, if you like, about the future of Europe, believing that something's going to turn up. But I genuinely believe that if we take the longer view, if we put the troubles of today in their proper perspective, then we will have the vision and the guts to actually stand up and realise that if this country pretends that somehow it's Norway or Switzerland or Iceland or Greenland, then it really has forgotten its historic role in the affairs of Europe. And I'll end on this note. 200 years ago, after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, we had the Congress of Vienna. Britain had been a major player in making sure that Napoleon Bonaparte and his breed of government was expunged from the European continent. Did it occur to, it, to British Tories that they wouldn't turn up at the Congress of Vienna? Did Lord Castlereagh decline to attend? No, he didn't. He went there and played a key part in what was a peace that lasted for the better part of a century in the main. Britain's role is firmly within Europe. For us to turn our back is not only to turn our back on our past, but it is to turn our back on our future. Thank you. <laughs>